Hey, it's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 43, and we're going to talk today about intermittent fasting, the diet that technically all of us are on, because unless you literally never stop eating, you are intermittently fasting. Every time you put down the fork, you are fasting. Congratulations. I'm fasting right now because I'm talking, not eating. And I assure you, I am getting no alternative means of feeding at the moment. There's no uh, intravenous feeding going on with me. No uh, rectal feeding, at least as far as I'm aware. I'm technically fasting right now, and I feel great, I guess. Intermittent fasting bugs me because it's one of these terms that taken literally doesn't mean anything, like lived experience, as though there's any other kind. The distinction you're looking for is first-hand experience versus second-hand experience, which is an important distinction, but they are both different kinds of lived experience because no one can experience anything if they are not alive. Literally any kind of eating that people actually do in practice can be described accurately as intermittent fasting, just as any food we eat could be described as nutritious food. If you're eating something that has no nutritive value, then it is, by definition, not food. Food is any nourishing substance. The reason we say nutritious food, even though it means the same thing as food, it just takes three extra syllables to get there, is because nutritious food is a shorthand. It's short for particularly nutritious food, food that is more nourishing than most other food. Though, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago when we talked about hearty foods, the word nutritious itself has drifted in recent decades as we in the developed world have gone from not getting enough macronutrients to getting way more macronutrients. And so now we describe foods as being nutritious when they are abundant in micronutrients and are, if anything, deficient in macronutrients. Regardless, nutritious food doesn't mean anything on its face because it is short for very nutritious food. Likewise, grammar pedants like to ding people for saying, I could care less to mean they don't care, when on its face it does mean the opposite. If it's possible for you to care less about something than you do now, then that means you care about it at least a little bit. But I'm pretty sure that I could care less is simply shorthand for as if I could care less, which is also sometimes abbreviated to as if, right? As if I could care less. He's yapping at me about my diet as if I could care any less about his opinion, which I can't because I presently care not at all about his opinion. Therefore, it would not be possible for me to care any less than I do now because my level of caring is at a zero. I could care less is short for all of that. And I will die on this hill defending the legitimacy of I could care less against pompous, unimaginative grammar scolds who aren't really interested in language. They're just interested in making other people feel small to make themselves feel tall. So is intermittent fasting short for very intermittent fasting? That doesn't quite work, does it? Maybe a better term would be extended fasting, indicating that the fasting periods are simply longer than what most people normally do in situations where they have continuous access to food. If people normally eat, say, three meals and a snack over their 16-hour waking day, well, that's four hours in between feedings, and therefore you could say extended fasting is any period longer than four hours that you go without eating. That seems like a good enough place to start though intermittent fasting protocols generally call for longer periods than that. The picture is even more complicated when one considers that lots of so-called intermittent fasting diet plans don't actually eliminate eating within the so-called fasting periods. They just highly restrict eating in those periods, going to maybe 25% of your normal caloric intake, for example. It's not fasting, it's fast-ish. The past is not even past, and the fast is not even a fast. I could do this all day. The terminology gets way better when you zoom in on particular schemes for so-called intermittent fasting. And there, of course, I'm using a scheme in the British sense of the word, which is a plan or a program 
such as a government program. The Brits say scheme in reference to government undertakings all the time, which sounds funny to us Americans because here, scheme has a more negative connotation. We usually say scheme in reference to illicit plans, illegal or unethical doings. And since people usually want to keep their illicit plans secret, scheming and plotting are synonymous in contemporary American English. This came up one time when I got a text message saying, Adam, you've been accepted for our COVID relief scheme. You are now eligible to earn $1,472 every day. And there was a link that I was supposed to click. So I texted back, pointing out that we do not refer to government programs as a scheme in American English. Their use of scheme gave them away as the foreign scammers that they undoubtedly are. And in that sense, their plan actually was a scheme in the American sense of the word. And their text message to me was more accurate than they intended. I posted this exchange on Twitter years ago, and some Brit replied, well, in fairness, Most government schemes in the UK are also schemes in the US meaning of the word because they are crooked. And I thought that was pretty funny. Anyway, the terminology gets a lot better when you focus on particular intermittent fasting plans, let's call them, such as whole day fasting, where you eat a little or nothing for for at least like a whole day. Skip a day fasting is another word for that. Skip a day fasting. That's a good and self-explanatory term. Hey, is that redundant? Is being self-explanatory a necessary condition of being a good term? I feel like it might be up to a point. I mean, you obviously can't learn everything you need to know about quantum mechanics by just hearing the words quantum mechanics. But if you know that quantum in the context of physics refers to the smallest possible amount of something, that basically tells you what you're getting into. I mean, the term is absolutely useless if you just go by a general English dictionary definition of quantum, which is an amount, any amount, big or small. So maybe quantum mechanics is a terrible term, too. I don't know. Nor do I know if extended periods of fasting are better for our health than any other kind of restricted eating, despite the fact that this has been studied pretty extensively, at least in shorter time horizons. Most of the studies we will look at follow people for a matter of weeks or months, and in those experimental and or observational studies, people usually don't lose much more weight than people on conventional calorie-restricted diets. The difference between eating fewer calories on a normal meal schedule versus eating fewer meals, and therefore probably fewer calories, doesn't seem to be a huge one, at least as far as body fat is concerned. What's much more interesting to me are the studies indicating other benefits from fasting. Potential mood benefits are the most interesting to me, followed by potential benefits for the other aspects of metabolic syndrome, like diabetes and high blood pressure and various kinds of inflammation. Be warned, every meta-analysis or literature review you'll find from standard scholarly sources ends with the same basic conclusion that intermittent fasting shows some clinical utility, but there's not enough data to indicate it's significantly better than comparable ways of eating. And there's basically no data yet about how intermittent fasting affects people in the long term over the decades of their lives. And that's a really important thing to investigate. People are investigating it now, but don't hold your breath waiting for the results. There is one absolutely gigantic, nonstop, global clinical trial of intermittent fasting that's been going on now since at least the year 624, and it's called Ramadan, the Islamic holy month of fasting. Muslims account for like 20% of the human race, and not all of them fast from dawn to dusk during the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. Lots of Muslims are, by tradition, exempted from that religious obligation to intermittently fast. Old people are exempted, sick people, little kids, women who are having or have recently had little kids, also travelers. And of course, not all Muslims observe all of their religious traditions, nor are they in lockstep about what exactly those traditions are. There are, for example, secular Muslims, particularly in a 
former Soviet states where lots of Muslims have lived for centuries, but the Soviets actively discouraged religious practice starting about 100 years ago. And now like 10% of Muslims in a place like Kazakhstan say that they, they do not practice the religion. They just identify as culturally Muslim, according to a Pew survey that I found. I found no global survey about what percent of Muslims actually fast for Ramadan. There's a Pew survey of Muslims in the United States that says about 80% of them fast for Ramadan. That would indicate that at least some of the, the seniors and the kids and such who are exempted from fasting do it anyway. And anecdotally, I have known secular Muslims who fast purely as a cultural habit, kind of the way that I, the least religious person in the world, I still live stream the Pope every Christmas Eve because it's just a thing that I do seems pretty safe to assume that at least a billion Muslims on this planet, 10% of all of the humans, at least go on intermittent fasting diets for 30 days every year across a huge diversity of nationalities and ethnicities and states of economic development and social statuses. And that presents an absolutely gigantic pool of firsthand experience that scientists can mine for data, which they have. Allow me to read the titles of just a few papers to you now. Effect of Diurnal Intermittent Fasting During Ramadan on Ghrelin, Leptin, Melatonin, and Cortisol Levels Among Overweight and Obese Subjects. Impact of Ramadan Intermittent Fasting on Oxidative Stress Measured by Urinary 15 Isoprostane. Effect of Intermittent Fasting During Ramadan on Sleep, Sleepiness, Cognitive Function, and Circadian Rhythm. Ramadan Intermittent Fasting and Immunity, an Important Topic in the Era of COVID-19. Effect of Ramadan Intermittent Fasting on Aerobic and Anaerobic Performance and Perception of Fatigue in Male Elite Judo Athletes. Impact of Ramadan Intermittent Fasting on Cognitive Function in Trained Cyclists. The effects of Ramadan intermittent fasting on football players and the implications for domestic football leagues over the next decade. Arousal and continuous attention during Ramadan intermittent fasting. I don't think the kind of arousal they're talking about there is the kind that I'm thinking about. One of the things I do when I'm presented with an enormous volume of studies on a given topic is I look for the most recent literature reviews or meta-analyses. The whole point of such big papers is to sum up all the little papers, and the conclusions drawn by the scholars doing the lit review might not be 100% correct, but I guarantee you they're more correct than conclusions that a normal like me might come up with on my own if I just tried to read all the little studies myself. You're not going to find a literature review encompassing every health dimension related to Ramadan fasting, but for a specific health topic, yeah, no problem. 2021, effects of Ramadan and non-Ramadan intermittent fasting on body composition, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Perfect. Remember, of course, that uh, scholarly articles are often not free. But you will generally find the abstract for free, and if you're just a normal like me, most of the information you could need is going to be in the abstract. Scientific literature generally does not traffic in clickbait, not yet at least. They don't hide their conclusions deep inside the article where you have to scroll past a dozen ads to find it. Though honestly, maybe they should do that. It's a better business model than legacy academic publishing. Literally anything is better than legacy academic publishing. I pay legacy academic publishers for access to articles all the time, but that's because I'm engaged in a for-profit enterprise, and I just figure that paying for articles is literally the least I can do to compensate for the value extraction that I am doing from this pool of knowledge. But I don't think you should pay for academic publishing unless you have some particular reason to. It's a, it's a dirty business. Anyway, the authors of this particular 
systematic review and meta-analysis compiled results from every relevant paper they could find, 66 in all, both observational and experimental studies. Experimental is when you recruit some people, you tell them what to do, you follow them really closely, and you track the results. Observational is when you simply mine anonymized medical data, the stuff that your nurse punches into a computer while you're sitting there waiting to be seen. Experimental studies are controlled, but tiny. Observational studies are chaotic and unreliable, but massive. Anyway, this recent review of uh, Ramadan intermittent fasting as it pertains to body composition, they found that both Ramadan intermittent fasting and non-Ramadan fasting, I'll call it secular intermittent fasting, they both consistently result in modest but statistically significant weight loss. And that weight loss is chiefly from body fluid and body fat. Previous scholarship had indicated that maybe there's some loss in lean body mass, like muscle that you burn off from not eating, which would be bad. And a particularly interesting finding of this recent meta-analysis is just the way that they crunched the numbers, they found no statistically significant decrease in lean body mass, which is good. Ramadan intermittent fasting generally results in a body weight reduction of about five percentage points, thereabouts. So I weigh 200 pounds. If I lost 5% of my body weight, that'd be 10 pounds of fluid and fat lost. Not bad in just a month. And that seems to be a pretty typical amount of weight loss for people observing Ramadan, at least among the Muslims who are likely to be studied, i.e. residents of highly developed nations where the capacity exists to gather this kind of data, People in such countries tend to have more body fat to lose, and therefore it's logical to wonder whether leaner, poorer Muslims suffer a similar loss in body mass. For them, such a loss would probably be a bad thing. In the case of the richer people being studied, a weight loss is usually a gain. Five percentage points of progress. One place where uh, you might be able to see some more impressive gains is in your investment portfolio if you choose to diversify your assets with Masterworks, sponsor of this episode. Masterworks has recently gotten their investors gains that are much greater than 5%. Masterworks lets you invest in multi-million dollar works of art from legendary artists like Picasso and Banksy. Masterworks' team of analysts use data from millions of auction records to source and buy art with the greatest potential appreciation. Then they divide the paintings into shares so that you can invest without needing millions of dollars. And when it comes to selling the paintings and getting you a profit, Masterworks just wrapped up one heck of a year. Nine exits, with four of those occurring just in the months since they started supporting this podcast. I'm talking about exits, handing back 21, 10, 13, 35% net. The contemporary art market is remarkably stable and independent of stocks and bonds. Even as stocks had their worst year since the 2008 crisis, art auctions hit a record high of almost $18 billion. Consider, with that 35% net return from Masterworks, if you had put in $15,000, you'd walk away with more than $20,000. Past performance is no guarantee of future success, but check out Masterworks and see if it might be the right option to diversify your portfolio. Masterworks has a wait list and shares of paintings have sold out in minutes, but you can skip the line by clicking my link in the description, masterworks.art slash ragusia. That's masterworks.art slash ragusia. Thank you, Masterworks. Anyway, this uh, 2021 literature review and meta-analysis looking at Ramadan fasting and weight loss. People on average seem to lose about 5% of their body weight from fasting dawn to dusk for a month. This meta-analysis found that Ramadan weight loss was slightly less than the results observed in comparable secular intermittent fasting plans. This is hardly surprising. People doing non-religious intermittent fasting are generally trying to improve their body composition, while people observing Ramadan are generally just trying to observe Ramadan, but they tend to lose almost as much weight nonetheless. The authors of this study attribute that to uh, unconscious restriction of food intake, meaning that 
If you don't plan to eat less during Ramadan, if instead you plan to fast all day and then hit the iftar buffet real hard, iftar is the evening meal that you eat after the sun goes down during Ramadan, even if you fully intend to make up for lost time at iftar, you still end up eating fewer calories on the day on average. This is consistent with all kinds of other research about diet. Virtually any restriction you put on your eating tends to result in fewer overall calories consumed, even if that isn't your intent. If you're just trying to avoid a certain ingredient, for example, that still tends to result in some weight loss because you just have fewer opportunities to stuff your face. Sorry, I can't have that. It has gluten in it or whatever. And instead of eating the cookies people are passing around, you eat nothing. Any restriction tends to result in fewer calories consumed, even when that isn't your goal. That's relevant for someone like me because that tells me that if I just commit to not eating during daylight hours for, say, health slash cosmetic reasons. I'm likely to lose a little weight even if I go buck wild when the sun goes down. Another factor these study authors mention is increased physical activity during Ramadan due to all of the extra extended periods of standing and praying throughout the day. Muslims generally do more during Ramadan than just the five basic daily prayers. They might spend hours a day on their feet at the mosque, and that burns calories in much the way that exercise routines burn calories among people who are doing secular fasting. So these factors might account for the really tiny difference we see in outcomes between Ramadan fasting and comparable secular fasting. Not eating during the day can definitely help you to drop a few pounds in a few weeks. Two billion Muslims around the world already know that. The problem is what happens next. Study after study finds that as soon as you go back to normal eating, you gain the weight right back, usually in fewer weeks than it took for you to lose it. The weight loss does not last, especially in the case of Ramadan fasting, because again, the main thing people are trying to do when they fast for Ramadan is do Ramadan. They're not necessarily trying to shift their caloric set point downward or whatever. But longer term effects of secular intermittent fasting tend to be just about as unimpressive. The long-term effects of every weight loss intervention are pretty unimpressive when studied at the large-scale population level. Basically, only bariatric surgery seems to work long-term, and it comes with all kinds of potentially horrible side effects and risks, and it's not clear the extent to which it actually improves your health. But getting back to Ramadan-style intermittent fasting, there's also some significant individual variation in the results. We've been talking averages thus far. Some people lose a ton of weight. Some people lose no weight at all. And one potential explanation for that is, surprise, surprise, gut health. Also from 2021, there's a study by Chinese and Dutch scientists looking at the effects of Ramadan fasting on people's gut microbiomes. They found that fasting provoked an upregulation of lactospiracy, which is a family of bacteria that produce butyric acid, the acid that gives Hershey's chocolate the fermented twang that reminds unaccustomed people of vomit or diarrhea because you have lots of butyric acid producing bacteria in your digestive system. Lactospiracy are the dominant family of bacteria in rumen, the uh, fermenting brew inside the stomachs of cows and other grass eaters. In humans, the butyric acid produced by lactospiracy in our guts is thought to help protect us against colorectal cancer and to alleviate symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, which is good. On the other hand, lactospiracy seem to impair glucose metabolism, leading to type 1 diabetes in vulnerable individuals, which is bad. You know, basically nothing is 100% good or 100% bad for your health. 
Ramadan-style fasting has been found to upregulate or turn on these butyric acid-producing bacteria in our guts. One possible explanation is that the mix of nutrients available in the gut of someone who fasts all day is just more favorable to lactobacillus, and thus they are able to outcompete the other gut bugs. And when there's more lactobacillus in your gut, there's more of the butyric acid they create in your gut. And some other studies have found butyric acid might promote the release of appetite suppressing hormones. So, when you hit the iftar buffet, you're not going to want quite as much shawarma and dates or whatever you're getting. There's also a positive association between butyric acid producing gut bacteria and better mental health. A couple of scientists in uh, Israel commenting on that study about Ramadan and gut microbiome said that underlying individual differences in microbiome may explain individual differences in weight loss and weight regain observed around Ramadan. I'm not saying it's all about gut health, people. Almost nothing is all about one thing, but it sure looks like gut health is a big part of basically all health. Moving on, Ramadan-style intermittent fasting isn't the only kind, obviously, and even if you do that kind of intermittent fasting, you don't have to do it during the daylight hours. Choose any eight hours in the day in which you want to confine all of your eating, and you'll be doing the 16-8 method, 16 hours of no eating, eight hours of eating in every day. Very popular. There's eat a day, skip a day. That's popular. People might have breakfast on their skip day, but nothing else. That seems sustainable to me. Then there's what I call lover boy fasting, where you eat very little during the week. And then on the weekend, look out. Every all-you-can-eat buffet in the vicinity, iftar-themed or otherwise, better close its doors. Everybody's working for the weekend. Dan and -da -da. lover boy, lover boy fasting. It's really quite extreme. Probably not something that any normal person could do for a long time. It's more of a trick used by like, athletes and other people who need to be very lean, like Sly Stallone. During the peak of Sylvester Stallone's 80s career, when he was on steroids and shredded, Sly said in interviews that he ate like 500 calories a day during the week, mostly protein. And then on the weekend, he'd black out and wake up Monday morning under a buffet line with his whole body covered in whipped cream and barbecue sauce. I imagine him kind of like Scrooge McDuck, the Disney character the miserly rich old duck who would get in his vault and swim through his hoard of gold coins like water. I like to imagine peak Stallone getting to Friday night and then diving headfirst into an Olympic swimming pool of delicious food. But two days on, five days off is pretty extreme. Much more common is the inverse. Five days of normal eating, two days of little or no eating every week. The 5-2 diet. That's popular. What may matter most is which schedule you're actually going to stick to. That's generally what experts in this field say. The best calorie-restricted diet of any kind is the one that you're actually going to do. So whatever works for you, works. There doesn't seem to be many systematic reviews of the research comparing the effects of different fasting schedules. Ramadan-style fasting, you know, don't eat for most of the day, that is by far the most studied, because one or two billion people do it for a month every year. But skip-a-day fasting has been studied a bit in experimental situations. The best literature review I can find comparing the two is from 2015, and they found Ramadan fasting and alternate day fasting show very similar results. People on average tend to lose about 5% of their body weight over a month or two, regardless of which fasting schedule they follow. The authors conclude... 
The same way they all conclude when writing about this topic by saying that research on the long-term fat loss effects of intermittent fasting is needed because we really don't know anything about the long-term effects just yet. Of course, health is about way more than body fat. For example, there is reason to suspect that fasting for periods longer than 16 hours habitually might increase your risk of developing gallstones. Fasting decreases the movement of bile through your gallbladder, and this can result in stones forming. That's a super controversial topic within the intermittent fasting community online, and I really don't want to go into it. It may only be super relevant to people who are already struggling with gallstone disease. I'm just mentioning it by way of example. What I am going to talk about for the rest of this episode is how intermittent fasting may benefit aspects of our health aside from body fat, aka way more important aspects of our health. I'm particularly excited to talk about mental health and fasting. I think there's a reason why fasting is, or has been, a ritual practiced in nearly every religion on earth. It's not just another kind of sacrifice to the gods. I mean, it is that. You deny yourself something that you want in order to demonstrate your devotion to a higher power, and perhaps to symbolically give that which you don't consume over to the higher power as tribute. Or to look at it more cynically, maybe religious fasting was originally a way for a priestly ruling class to make the ruled class feel okay about not having enough food. Your suffering is sacred. You should all be happy about it, the priest said as he retreated to the temple where he was hoarding all the food. It's for a sacrifice. I swear, guys, it's for a sacrifice. I'm totally not eating it myself. Religious fasting, historically, was probably about all of the above to one extent or another, but I think it was also about achieving the state of mind that fasting puts you in. If you're not Muslim and you've been reasonably economically secure your whole life, and if you have a healthy body image, so you've never starved yourself like I have before, you may have absolutely no idea what fasting feels like. You may have consumed at least a few hundred calories every single day of your life. You've been hungry, obviously, but that's not the same thing as being fasted. And being fasted for a day is not the same thing as being fasted for two or three days. People generally divide fasting into like four or five different states or stages, though that is somewhat arbitrary and there is not a hard boundary between the stages. The early fasting state starts about four hours after you last ate. That's why you usually eat every three or four hours naturally. Three or four hours after you last ate, you will have used up most of the blood glucose from your last meal. So the next energy source your body turns to is glycogen. As starch is to glucose in plants, glycogen is to glucose in animals and fungi. Yet another way in which mushrooms are more similar to you and me than they are to plants. Mushrooms are not plants. Anyway, glycogen and starch are just different types of glucose polymer, giant complexes of thousands of glucose units all bonded together in one super molecule. The big difference is that glycogen, the one you find in animals, is based around a core protein called glycogenin. When your extra glucose is stored in a giant polymer, it's less likely that some microorganism in your body is going to metabolize that glucose energy before you can. That's one of many reasons that plants and animals evolved to store their glucose in big polymers. Starch in the case of plants, glycogen in the case of you and all other people. Good people, bad people. If you're looking for some good people who are 
full of energy, as it were, consider hiring your next employee with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract job candidates, interview and hire them all in one place. More than 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Don't spin your wheels bouncing back and forth between different job boards. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match assessments, and virtual interviews. According to Indeed's U.S. data, more than 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates the moment they sponsor a job and Indeed matches a candidate's resume with your job description. And candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply for your job compared to candidates who only see your job in search. Again, according to U.S. Indeed data. And get this, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Indeed knows that hiring has to be cost-effective when you're running your own business, like I do. So do you and me both a favor? Visit indeed.com slash ragusia to start hiring now. That's indeed.com slash ragusia. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Anyway, glycogen, the starch of the animal kingdom. When you run out of blood glucose from your last meal, your body turns to glycogen stores, which are in your liver and your muscles. Actually, your body releases hunger hormones, urging you to eat so that it doesn't have to dip into the glycogen stores. But if you resist, if you don't eat, enzymes break the glycogen down, and then you've got more glucose for your bloodstream. This is also when you start to pee, exhale, or otherwise eliminate fluid. Glycogen is bound with water in your body in a three to one ratio, three grams of water for every one gram of glycogen. So when you use up the glycogen, you expel the water one way or another. Also, the longer you go without eating, the longer you go without salt and other electrolytes that cause you to retain water in order to maintain optimal electrolyte to water balance. If you have fewer electrolytes, you need to get rid of some of the water to maintain that balance. Those are the two big reasons why reducing your food intake causes you to lose water weight quickly and dramatically. If you eat little or nothing for a couple of days, you'll probably lose a couple of pounds of water weight. Anyway. When your body starts to run out of liver glycogen, it'll turn to triglycerides, the fats that are floating around in your bloodstream, and it might turn to free amino acids, the components of proteins for energy. All of that happens between 4 and 18 hours after your last meal. Ramadan-style fasting allows your body to do that every day. Clear out all of your easily accessible energy stores. It's like cleaning your plate completely before you go back up to the buffet. Simply going that far without food, 18 hours or probably even less, you can realize some health benefits according to too many studies to even mention. It's super well established. Just Google it. That kind of fasting lowers your blood pressure temporarily, but if you fast like that every day or almost every day, that adds up to being a state of lower blood pressure most of the time, most of your life. The mechanisms by which short-term fasting lowers your blood pressure are not fully understood. One obvious reason is probably just all of that water you eliminate as you use up electrolytes and glycogen, but we know it's a lot more complicated than that because people with absolutely no change in body weight still see their blood pressure drop in a fasted state. Fasting relaxes your nervous system, which maybe causes the blood vessels to open up a little, vasodilation. It's what they call the rest and digest state, a state that we evolved to have when we're no longer fighting for food. We've eaten all we can, and now we chill out, relax, let our bodies finish chugging on everything that we have eaten. 
I think an obvious explanation for why we get hungry every three hours, even though we have plenty of glycogen and triglycerides and such available, is to keep us near a source of food. If we're hanging out in a tree with plenty of juicy fruit, or if we're hanging out near a giant wildebeest carcass, we're evolved to eat as much of that as we can before moving on. So three or four hours after we eat, our stomach is all cleared out, we've got room, we can go in and gorge ourselves again. And we're evolved to do that as long as the food lasts. When we're continuously fed like that, our sympathetic nervous system is kind of hyped up, perhaps to help us fight off competitors for the same food, perhaps to facilitate digestion. And when we've eaten the whole wildebeest and we've moved on, half a day later, our body is like, okay, well, I guess there definitely is no more wildebeest coming. So let's relax the nervous system, chill out and do the later stages of digestion. And in that state, your blood vessels open up a bit. Here's a 2022 experimental study where they took 25 young people with normal blood pressure, no doubt college students, it's always students at the school where the scientists work. They took 25 young people and did a whole bunch of cardiovascular tests on them in a fed state and a 24-hour fasted state. And what they found is that fasting seems to change the way the heart beats perhaps in response to this relaxation of the nervous system, enhanced vagal cardiac modulation, it's called, the heart rate of their test subjects decreased in the fasted state and stroke volume increased 13%. It's 13% more blood moving with every beat of the heart. We won't go into why these things are good for the cardiovascular system, mostly because I don't fully understand it, but There's a lot of reason to think that they're good for the cardiovascular system. Anyway, after you've fasted for about 18 hours, you go into the next stage. You've gone through all of your liver glycogen. You still have your muscle glycogen. That's there for a totally different purpose. Muscle glycogen is there to fuel high intensity exertion, fighting or running or hitting the gym, etc. Muscle glycogen is a different thing. After 18 hours or so of fasting, you've depleted your liver glycogen, which is there to maintain blood glucose levels. This is when your body starts to dip into your body fat stores for energy, which is obviously great for losing weight if you want to. And around this point, your body is going to start to transition into ketosis. Your liver uses fatty acids to make ketones that your brain and other vital organs and tissues can burn for energy in the absence of glucose. This is not a transition that happens all at once. Ketosis ramps up over the course of several days fasted, but it starts after you've been fasting for like half a day. I once said some critical things about the ketogenic diet in a video. I regret how I said them. That was in my early days when I was still doing hot takes. I generally don't do hot takes anymore because... Once you have a large audience, you see how hot takes introduce viral negativity into the world, and the world doesn't need that. But anyway, I talked about how the ketogenic diet was not developed for weight loss. Rather, it was developed to treat epilepsy in kids, which is true, and I showed an actual ketogenic diet for an epileptic kid, and it was like Heavy cream for breakfast, heavy cream for lunch, butter for dinner. The idea is to replace the carbs in a normal diet almost entirely with fats, thereby creating a perpetual state of ketosis because your liver has to convert those dietary fats into ketones for your body to burn in the absence of dietary carbs. And for reasons that people still don't really understand, this significantly reduces the number of seizures that some kids get. Anyway, a guy in the comments wanted to challenge how I defined the ketogenic diet. He said something to the effect of, you don't have to eat a high fat diet to be on keto. You just have to fast. And I was like, dude, that's not keto. 
That's just not eating. Yes, not eating, fasting will plunge you into ketosis as your body turns to your body fat stores for energy. Your liver has to convert some of those fatty acids into ketones, but that's not what anybody in medical science talks about when they talk about a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is one that still has a fair number of calories in it, enough to be in caloric balance for a normal person or caloric surplus for a growing kid or a slight caloric deficit for someone who's trying to lose weight, but you're still getting those calories from fat and protein instead of carbs. And as a result, you stay in a constant state of elevated ketosis. Whether that's good for anything other than treating pediatric epilepsy is something that I promise to talk about another day. There's a lot more research about that now than there was when I talked about keto in a video a couple of years ago. And I promise to be more civil in talking about keto next time. Anyway, ketosis, which is not the same thing as being on keto. Ketosis starts to ramp up after like half a day of fasting and gradually increases over the next three days or so if you keep fasting. This is the period that usually hurts the most. The period when you've exhausted your glycogen and such, but ketosis is not yet in full effect. This is when you suffer from terrible brain fog your hunger hormones are slapping you over the head, telling you to get your ass in gear and find food. But as your liver starts making more and more ketones, your hunger hormones chill out. Your brain snaps back to life. You feel okay again. And something weird happens. You might feel a little better than okay. I don't want to defend the stupid crash diets that I've done in my life, but one thing I've definitely experienced and enjoyed is this transition after about two or three days of not eating, when you go from feeling terrible to feeling better than okay. You have this calmness. When I'm fasted like that, I just feel chill. I'm still hungry. And my mouth tastes bad and I have bad breath. Google keto breath if you want to know what I'm talking about. But emotionally, I feel really even keel, which is a marked contrast from the frantic hunger and brain fog of the first day or two of fasting. And it's a marked contrast with my normal state of being in which I am anxious and or glum much of the time. Like many people, I struggle with mood problems. I haven't talked about this much publicly, but it's a thing. I had a panic attack at the mall the other day. An honest to God panic attack where I saw stars and my skin felt all fuzzy and I fell over. Actually, I was able to like sit down before I fell over. We have to go to a formal event soon, and I haven't worn my suit in a long time. I am both fatter and more muscular than I was when I bought that suit, so it doesn't fit. I absolutely abhor clothes shopping, but Lauren made me go, and she was right to do so. We have to go to this thing, and I need a suit for it. I went to the store that I normally go to, and literally none of their suits were big enough for me, which is crazy considering that I am not a super big person. I'm a large I'm not even an extra large. And this sent me down a shame spiral and I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go home. I am also just generally nervous and uncomfortable around other people. And the mall is full of other people. I've gotten more introverted and withdrawn as I've gotten older. And with the pandemic and me switching from a real job to making videos on my computer by myself for a living, my socialization muscles have really atrophied. So I was already like at my simmering point when we were at the mall. And when I couldn't get a new suit at my normal store because I'm too big, Lauren said we should go to the department store. And I was like, no, no, no. I am especially uncomfortable in department stores. Maybe this goes back to some minor childhood traumas with my parents buying me clothes in old-fashioned department stores, and they said things about my body that are seared in my brain like a brand. 
That's not a dig at my parents. I love my parents. They were great parents. But nearly everyone I talk to seems to have a memory like that, something humiliating that happened to them in a changing room when they were kids buying clothes with their parents. I'm sure I will make the same mistakes with my own kids. I probably already have. It's just a generational rite of passage. I also just hate clothes and I hate thinking about my appearance. So I'm not good at wearing clothes, especially formal clothes. And I'm super intimidated by a legit menswear section in a nice department store. It just makes me feel like a stupid child, which I know is crazy now that I'm a legit man, a 40 year old well-to-do man who can afford the finest suit they have. And yet I still don't feel good enough for that. I'm still intimidated by the salesman and the tailor, and I just, I had to get out of there. And that's when my skin felt hot and fuzzy and my vision went tunnel. And I told Lauren, I feel like I'm going to fall over. I need to sit down. And she was like, yeah, you're having a panic attack. And she was great. And she got me through it. She did guided breathing with me until I could stand up again. I shared this story to convey that in spite of my rather jolly hedonistic internet persona, which does come from a real part of my personality, I also have an anxious and gloomy personality. And it's amazing how those clouds lift when I fast, when I get into full ketosis. I feel kind of low energy, but even energy. I feel quiet and cool and content. I'm hungry and weak, And my mouth tastes bad, but I'm otherwise happy. Sometimes I feel doomed to either be fed and anxious or starving and calm. Those are my only two options. Anyway, I would bet that this is one reason why fasting is part of nearly every ancient religious and quasi-religious practice. The state of mind you achieved after a few days of fasting just feels holy, especially in contrast to the suffering of the first couple days of the fast. You deprive yourself, you suffer, and then you are rewarded by achieving what feels like an elevated plane of existence. It's heavenly in its pleasant placidity. It's quiet contentment. It's a microcosm of the broader spiritual journey that is envisioned by most religions. Virtuous self-denial, followed by suffering, followed by reward. This is the long-term fasted state, a.k.a. the starvation state. And it doesn't feel good all the time. You have episodic hunger pangs that get so powerful, they physically hurt. They double you over. You have episodes of irritability and your energy levels are low, but you still feel good psychologically. I mean, certainly not everyone feels that way all the time when fasting, but I am hardly alone in experiencing these mood benefits of longer term fasting. This is well documented by science, very common. And why does it happen? Here's a 2022 literature review out of China. The effect of fasting on human metabolism and psychological health in no particular order. Here's some of the stuff from that review. Fasting depletes leptin, which is an anti-hunger hormone. It's literally made in your fat cells. It's there to say, you've eaten enough. We've got plenty of excess energy to store as fat. You can stop eating now. But at the same time, high leptin levels have been implicated in mood disorders like depression for reasons not fully understood. Fasting depletes leptin, which might make you hungry, but also happy. And that's just one example of the hormonal effects of fasting. There are others. It might all have to do with adapting the brain's reward system to a state of involuntary starvation. It's winter. There's no food to be had. You need to derive reward from survival activities other than eating. 
Fasting increases all kinds of neurotransmitters associated with happiness, dopamine, serotonin, and these increases may directly cause or be indirectly associated with brain growth, neurotrophic effects, growth of nervous tissue. I quote now, Fasting can stimulate neurogenesis and enhance synaptic plasticity, which can regulate pain sensations and enhance cognitive function and the anti-aging ability of the brain. Nobody knows why this happens, but it seems logical to me that extended fasting is an inevitable part of the natural life for which our bodies are evolved, our pre-agrarian lifestyle, and we may simply have evolved to use those inevitable, involuntary fasts to do things that our bodies and our brains need done, that we simply can't do when we're processing food all the time. Maybe that's essentially what's happening in the brain as we fast. Your body says, hey, while the uh, digestive system is shut down for a while and we're all just sitting around, let's, uh, let's clear some of the cobwebs out of the brain. Analogous things seem to be happening throughout the body during fasting. All kinds of cellular repair and turnover, autophagy, it's called. This is part of how fasting seems to reduce chronic inflammation. Fasting has been shown to increase stem cell production, which is important for all kinds of things. Here's an example. The cells in your intestines are real busy, and they need to be constantly regenerated at a rate way faster than most of the other cells in your body. The lining of the intestine fully regenerates over the course of every five days. Your body makes stem cells in your intestines to replace the old cells as they rotate out of action, as it were. This ability to regenerate intestinal stem cells declines a lot with age, and that contributes to nutrient malabsorption in old people. In a 2018 study out of uh, MIT, they starved mice for 24 hours to look at changes in their intestinal cells. The scientists found that fasting caused the cells to oxidize stored fatty acids for energy in the absence of glucose, and this improved cellular function and regenerative capacity. I could go on and on with examples like that, where fasting seems to allow cells to clear out old junk, as it were. Again, almost every paper ends with more research is needed on the long-term effects because long-term effects are much harder to research. But there seems to be a lot of reason to believe that fasting frequently from anywhere between half a day and a few days seems to be good for your health, apart from or in addition to the modest benefits that fasting can confer in weight loss. Intermittent fasting, imperfect as that term may be, is probably our natural state of being, and we are unsurprisingly evolved for it. That doesn't mean we all have to intermittently fast. Scientists researching these benefits are trying to use them as the basis for Pharmaceutical therapies, drugs you could take that would artificially create the conditions brought about naturally with a fast. Have your own conversation with yourself about whether that's a good thing. I have mixed feelings about the pharmaceutical industry, but I'm super glad my children survived infancy, which they only had a two in three chance of doing prior to modern medicine. Modern medicine has a pretty damn good track record compared to everything else. The benefits obviously outweigh the harms, at least in terms of longevity. I don't know what I'm going to do with any of this information, except that I am now doubly motivated to break my recent streak of night snacking. I've gotten in this real bad sleep pattern lately where I go to sleep early, which is great. I've been able to go to sleep much earlier since I re- reduced my, uh, my video release schedule. But then I wake up at one or two in the morning ravenously hungry and I eat something and this is probably making me fatter because it's extra calories and calories eaten at night seem to be more like to be stored as fat, according to several studies. More importantly, this night eating is depriving my body of its natural 8 to 12 hour nocturnal fasting period, which is 
probably important for my health in lots of ways. I'm going to try to run the tank down to empty more often before filling it up again. I'm happy to have filled your tank with another hour of the Adam Ragusea podcast. If you have a topic for a future episode, hit me up at askadamquestions at gmail.com. If you want me to be able to use your question in the show, send a video or audio file of you asking the question, askadamquestions at gmail. Say a prayer for me as I am about to shadow a donut maker for his entire shift, which obviously begins at about two in the morning. Working nights all the time is hard, but arguably even harder is to work one night here and there because your circadian rhythm just doesn't have the time to adjust. When I used to work at Sheets, the convenience store, I would pick up a third shift every now and then, you know, midnight to 8 a.m., and man, did it hurt to do that and then try to slide back into normal diurnal life. But the good part is that you get to be awake for that magical hour between 4.30 and 5.30, when the worlds of people who are up very late cross with the worlds of people who are up very early. Very different people, very different worlds. It's almost like two parallel universes that jump across each other around 5 a.m. Related note, I saw the new movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and I heartily recommend it. It's a good choice. Make good choices. And I'll talk to you next time.